buzzer. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday, April 25th, 2019, uh, meeting of the uh, Dinah Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Roll call, please, Ms. Allison. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Staunton. Here. Commissioner Brindle. Here. Commissioner Anderson. Chair Hovland. Here. Uh, we have a form of meeting agenda in front of us uh, this morning. Uh, Manager Neal, uh, Executive Director Neal, anything you want to modify on the agenda? Uh, no, sir. That's right. good to Any, go. Anyone else have any uh, changes to the agenda? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as shown. So moved. Second. And a motion second to approve the meeting agenda as shown. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, community comment. Is there anyone uh, in the audience that wishes to address the HRA on a matter of concern to them that's not otherwise on the agenda this morning? All right, seeing no one coming forward, we'll move on to the uh, consent agenda. We have uh, several items on the consent agenda. Is there anyone on the, any commissioner that wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? Hearing nothing, is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda as shown? So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as shown. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then we're on to reports and recommendations, and uh, we have a couple of, uh, we have one matter that uh, we had laid over for a couple of weeks. And Stephanie Hawkinson, our affordable housing development manager, has this matter. I think this was one that we were eager to talk about two weeks ago and just as eager today. It wasn't very convincing, was it? <laughs> that all good? something to talk about today or else you would be out of here before quarter to eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am here. Good morning. Um, in February, we presented you a proposal to grant AON 300. I'm just going to have you pause for a second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lindgren. Mr. Anhut, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks for um, that uh, interruption. Oh, no problem. Um, so in February, we presented to you a proposal to grant Aon $350,000 in order to make possible their acquisition of 7008 Sandell, an 11-unit apartment building with current rent serving households with incomes below 80% of area median income. Aon has agreed that as units turn over, 40% of the units, which five of them, will have rents reduced to serve households with incomes at or below 60%. And the remaining six units will have rent serving remaining at or below 80%. So the property um, is direct west of France behind the Roman board. So it's a small building in the middle of the block. It was built in 1961. Um, the stats are on the slide. 11 units, two stories, and they're all two bedroom units. Our grant would account for 1% of the overall budget. There is, um, they're buying a portfolio of 16 buildings, 15 of which are in Minneapolis, and this is the only one in Edina. So it's under one transaction. Um, so the, even though it's, you know, we're focused on the 11 unit building, this is part of a $30 million transaction. And so our 350,000 is about 1% of the whole budget. So in the time since um, the grant was approved, we have been working with the attorneys to negotiate the grant agreement and declaration of restricted covenants that requires that the property remain affordable for 30 years. Uh, the intent is that they would sign the documents and hold them in escrow. They would like our money to be available at closing for the acquisition. I wanted to um, just talk about the organization a little bit because um, you'll see the documents. There's two different um, agreements, I mean, two different entities that are signing. 
So our grant agreement was with Ann, and Ann, it's because they are a nonprofit organization. They will be entering into a contribution agreement with Ann Villanova LLC. So this LLC will be owning the 16, will be a general partner of uh, ownership entity that's owning the 16 buildings. And Ann is the managing member of that LLC. Ann will then be committing the 350,000 that we are granting them to the LLC. So they'll have this inner, this agreement where they will contribute as equity into the LLC. And then the LLC, Ann Villanova will be executing as managing member of the ownership, they will be signing the declaration. So the grant agreement and the declaration reflect what was approved in the term sheets um, that were approved in February, aside from one point. Um, the term sheet included a provision that the HRA get first right of refusal if Ann were to sell the property. However, Freddie Mac is the lender, and Freddie Mac will not accept those terms. Um, so, but as Aon is a long-term holder of their properties with a mission to house low and moderate income households, staff is amenable to removing that provision. So could I ask you a question about that provision? I want to go back to your staff report here. Yeah, there's a questions thing right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even need my glasses for that screen. <laughs> questions. All right, so I'll... I'll uh, I'll ask you a question, uh, because I understood what you were, you were trying to do as a, as a right of uh, first offer, you call it, in the memo on the project. During the term of affordability, is uh, their intended lender, Freddie Mac, will not accept these terms. So my question is, uh, when the 30-year term is up, uh, at the end of that term, uh, if they decide, or at subsequent to that 30-year term, if they decide not to hold on to the property or keep it affordable, would we have a right of uh, first refusal if they decided to sell it uh, once we get past that term that Freddie Mac is concerned about uh, and have some way to at least uh, marginally or prospectively protect ourselves and keep this property affordable uh, into the indefinite future beyond that initial 30-year period? Is there some legal way to do that? I guess that's the overarching question. I would need to um, go back to our attorney because the declaration is for the 30 years. And so um, we have no stake in the property at all after that 30 year term as it's written now. Aon is a long term holder of affordable properties. That is their mission, that is their reason they are. Um, and so their intent is to keep it affordable forever but we have nothing written in the documents mm -hmm. that say after the term of the declaration is done, um, then we want to be able to negotiate a sale or have us have a first right refusal because we're pretty much out of the deal. Yeah. I'm just thinking that if we had a long-term goal of keeping it affordable beyond the 30-year period, it would be nice to know how to fashion something that could potentially work. You know, I don't think I'll be here 30 years from now, but Mary and Mike and Kevin, they might be here and they might want to buy that property um, to keep it affordable. So, uh, you know, I don't know what could be done. We're, we're on the verge of approving it here, and I think it's a good idea to approve it. But um, in 30 years is certainly a, a healthy period of time to keep something affordable. I, I guess your advice is to do the deal that's in front of us. Uh, my advice is that in part because in 30 years the building will also be 30 years older, and it was built in the 60s, and so it's going to be a pretty old building by then. And we, uh, it's hard to forecast what kind of shape it will be in. And if it stays as is, um, it will be naturally affordable anyway. And I, I don't believe that they, the market would bear rents that were very high on such an old building. Um, if it is not a sound building, then I think we're going to have to figure out mm -hmm. at that time what to do with that site. Yeah. So if uh, Don uses a tickler system and for whoever's the future finance director sees a year in advance that this is coming up at the end of its 30-year uh, dedication, you know, maybe we can start having a conversation if some future council is interested in that. So that's my only observation. I think that's probably a good, good way to handle it. Um, okay. 
And you, in the language of the, decla uh, the declaration, I think uh, Dorsey worked on the declaration, we're comfortable that uh, we're protected in all ways, whether there's a sale. I mean, if Aon sells to somebody else, that property is staying affordable for 30 years regardless who owns it. Correct. Okay. And the declaration language is very similar to what um, the language that the investor has and their declaration. There's going to be lots of declarations. So the investor has a declaration, um, and the Minneapolis on their properties will have a declaration, and the language is similar amongst all of them. All right. Good. Thank you. Other questions? Um, Member Brindle. Commissioner you, Brindle. Thank you. Uh, do you know when closing is? I'm just curious. Later in May, I do so not. So it is. It is coming right up. It is coming up. This okay. was um, holding it over. We had to look at the calendars to make sure that was okay that we held it over for two weeks because um, we're we're getting closer to the closing time. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Sutton. Can you tell me a little bit more about the public access agreement, Chair Commissioners? The public access agreement is allowing. Um, an easement for the 15 feet from the border of Sandell into their lot. Um, the Southdale area plan shows the West Promenade going up on the west side, and this, if that comes to fruition, this allows us to use those 15 feet to extend the promenade. Terrific. That's what I thought. I think it's great that we're keeping that in mind as we talk about these kinds of properties. It's another piece in the larger puzzle and when we get these opportunities we ought to seize them so thank you for including that um chair commissioners i'd like to add to on Ann's other property which is further south yeah. they um we met with them at council yesterday and they had incorporated in their design the path along the eastern edge of that site as well to start Perfect. putting in the pieces for that promenade well done Right, good. Yeah, this was a great piece of work. Thanks to everybody that worked on this. So, could, I, could I just add yes, a quick uh, comment? I, Commissioner, not to Commissioner. pile on, but um, you know, oftentimes we see, or there, there's sort of this um, idea in public organizations, especially that you know, different silos are all doing their own thing and they're not working together. And I think this is actually an example where s clearly staff are all talking to each other. That um, we're doing a a deal here that would seemingly be unrelated to all this other planning going on in the community, and yet um, you're all talking and you're, you're figuring out like this public access. It's a great example of awareness of everything that's going on, all the other planning, and I just want to applaud our staff for being on top of that. So thank you. Good. Thanks. Any other commissioner comments? All right. Uh, we need a motion to approve the grant agreement, uh, the declaration of restrictive covenants, and accept the public access easement for 7008 Sandell Avenue and authorize staff to implement the terms of the agreements. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Motion and second. Uh, second by Member Brindle. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of passing the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Yeah, terrific. Um, no correspondence? Ms. Allison? Yeah. Okay. And there was uh, none online either. Uh, HRA Commissioner comments? Any comments from anyone? I just have yeah. a, Commissioner a Brindle? question. Um, so we started talking about preservation of single family homes. Um, and when, I guess, when I started talking about it was when it appeared in uh, former Governor Dayton's Housing Task Force report last August that was released last August. Um, what are next steps that, um, that we would need to take or begin investigating to um, come up with a plan to help, <clears throat> pardon me, help residents in our community understand the benefits of, of preserving single family homes for affordable and, uh, and creating a program around that? Uh, Commissioner Brindle and members of the HRA, uh, I can tell you that uh, back in the f April 2nd, uh, I think it was the April 2nd work session, we had a brief discussion um, around a proposal uh, that uh, Commissioner Snotton raised to create a, a housing strategy task force. And uh, there was interest in the, I guess that was the council, 
So there was interest in the council members about uh, taking that um, approach to, to this issue. Okay. Not just looking at one sector of housing, whether it's affordable housing or it's residential redevelopment or senior housing, but taking a comprehensive look at the entire spectrum of housing in the community through a community task force uh, that would um, investigate the issue and prepare uh, and make a report back to the council and or HRA. And so we've been working on that since that uh, initial discussion with the, with the council and uh, we're gonna make a presentation to you at your next council meeting about how we would go about uh, establishing that task force, how we would populate it, and looking for the council's approval on it that night. Great, thank you. So that's more an answer of how we would get mm -hmm. to uh, study the issue, um, and that hopefully brings forward some solutions. Good, I, I just wanted to make sure that it is moving, and, and it is, so thank you. Good. Other comments? Um, just looking at, looking at some notes, uh, Manager Neal and I attended the chamber luncheon yesterday with the state demographer. And um, it was interesting because we've been seeing some things in our um, community about uh, the projections uh, from the Met Council about growth. Uh, what we desire for growth uh, as a council or an HRA, which is an, an inaccurate assertion. Uh, but when you listen to the state demographer uh, and you ask her the question, your demographic data shows very little growth uh, in Edina uh, versus the Met Council model, which is she characterizes more of an economic model. Um, and they're both projections uh, using different data. Um, but uh, her in-migration numbers just for the metropolitan region were uh, interesting, and I'll, I'll try to do a little write-up on all of that, and I think it's uh, interesting to look at it, and I suppose the truth lies somewhere in between. Uh, between, um, I think, 2010 and 2017, Edina grew by uh, 4,500 people, but it, uh, that was growth that we hadn't experienced uh, in, the, in the past 20 years before that, I think. So many, the, the largest growth was in the inner cities, uh, 41,000 uh, added in Minneapolis, and that uh, seven-year period of time, 24,000 in St. Paul. And then she talked about the tight, tight labor market uh, and the lack of population growth. And of course, we, we get people two ways. Either they're created organically here or, or they in-migrate. And uh, in-migration is down both domestically and uh, internationally, internationally down significantly. So when we think about um, how we're gonna continue to keep our town vital and prosperous and have families moving in here, you know, all of this demographic data that we're getting, plus the analysis of uh, our own data that we can look at from the Met Council demographers, I think will help us with some good decision making and, and it will help the public too understand uh, a little bit better about where, we're, where we think we're heading and what we need to be mindful of as we uh, think about uh, keeping our town vital and prosperous with young people and young families moving in and having places for older folks to, to move to as they want to stay here the rest of their lives. So. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, Commissioner Staunton. Without getting into a full-blown discussion, and I, th I would say that folks ought to also be paying attention to the, the trends on households, number of households. And um, suffice it to say that from 1970 to, 19, to 2010, we didn't have dramatic growth in population, but we did have dramatic growth in the number of households. And the reason is that the per per person household size dropped. You know, we didn't have families with six, seven, eight, nine kids anymore. We had families with two and three kids. And so, um, but that doesn't mean we didn't grow. We kept building houses all the way through the end of the century. We had vacant property. Now we don't have any more vacant property. How are we gonna make room for new families who are gonna populate the schools? Mm -hmm. That's gonna be a question we're gonna need, need to be thinking about. One other little piece of information from the state demographer was that we're averaging now into the seven county metropolitan area about 11 to 15,000 people a year. Uh, so you can see that these numbers aren't significant. Um, so when you look at that data compared to the Met Council projections at 700,000 by 2040, um, I think it'll be interesting for us uh, both as an HRA and a council to go through that analysis and for our town to, uh, folks in our town to uh, understand it uh, well, too. So, 
That's it. Manager Neal, anything? No, other than to, uh, to sharpen those, com those uh, comments from Susan Brower yesterday, um, you know, her model as the state demographer is to talk about how many new bodies there will be in Minnesota and even how many new bodies, uh, how many new people uh, there will be in the seven county metro area. The Met Council then takes that information and sharpens it even more to say of those new people that will be living in the metropolitan area, where will they live? You know, will they live, will they live in, the, in, uh, in Minneapolis? Will they live in Lakeville? Will they live in the inter, in entering suburbs? They make some value decisions based on trend analysis they're seeing about where young people live, where empty nesters live, et cetera, and they sharpen those numbers even further. So they are related, um, but that's how, they're, that's how the Met Council uses that data. Good, thank you. And again, uh, as you point out, uh, and she did as well, that if you look at national data, the, the groups that move the most significantly that could potentially in migrate are the 18 to 29 year olds. Those are the ones that are moving around looking for a place that they can call home and, and want to be for a while, so. Mr. Chair, could I just, I, I've been trying to measure? hold myself back, but I'm just gonna say something. <laughs> and I'm sure we're gonna have a lot more conversation on this, but this whole discussion we're seeing in the community about these numbers um, is revealing in many ways. Um, but there is a fact that people are born, people die, and people move around. And we've known for a long time, and demographers have told us for decades what's going to happen in our Twin Cities area. Um, and so that just happens. And so we can throw around numbers and... But, but there's this fallacy out there that somehow we have a, a, a ticker at the borders of our community and that at some point we're going to put up a wall or shut the door or whatever. And that's not what a comp plan is. It's not, you know, it's, we're, we're folks out there, professionals in this business are projecting population changes, but it's not like we're saying we want X number of people to move here by this date. It's not the way it works. Um, you know, I would hope that at some point, you know, the market forces, as people decide where they want to live, you respond to that. So when we work on land use and things like that, it's how you respond to market forces. But there's nowhere in there you know, that I'm aware of where communities say, here's the number of people we're going to allow to live here. And I think that's the the misconception that's going on when all these numbers are being talked about. And we're going to have to have more discussion about this because I think there are actually people out there that think we're, you know, we're determining, you know, this group of five people is sitting around thinking about how many people we want to live here and we're going to control that somehow. Um, so more discussion to happen. Yeah. Good. Thanks. All right. Um, well, that's uh, I'm not done with my coffee yet. <laughs> Me either. We'll have to sit here and talk to each other after the meeting. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to get used to looking at you without your beard now, so, yeah. It's spring now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything further for the HRA? All right, we stand adjourned.